If tomorrow all the things were gone that I worked for all my life and I had to start over again with just my children and my wife, I'd thank my Lord above to be living here today because that flag stands for freedom. And they can't take it away. I'm proud to be an American. Where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died. Who gave that right to me. And I'd gladly stand, stand up, up next to you. And defend her still today. There ain't no doubt I love this land. I love this land. God, God bless, bless the USA. Well, oh, there ain't no doubt I love this land. I love this land. Oh, my Lord. God, God bless, bless the USA. USA. Salvation and glory, mm -hmm. honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God, for the Lord our God is mighty. The Lord our God, yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. Well, the, the Lord, Lord our, our God, God he is, is wonderful. For the, the Lord, Lord our God, our God he is wonderful. One more time. The Lord, the Lord who made this country God, great, he is wonderful. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I know you didn't think we'd have a no-show tonight, did you? I want to say to you, happy 4th of July. I pray that you have been enjoying yourself as you have celebrated the 4th of July. I have a special uh, greetings that I'm going to uh, give you just a moment, but I want to read something to you uh, that, that brings to light the things that we are celebrating and talking about today. This was written on July the 4th, 1776. It reads as follows. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This letter, this declaration of independence were written by 13 states, men who signed a Actually, what would have been a death warrant had we not prevailed and uh, sent word to England that we are free and that we are a separate nation, hence the birth of America. And we are celebrating today the 4th of July. And at this time, I would like to bring my wife, Pamela. She's here with me, and she's going to give you a 4th of July greetings. Would you receive her at this time, honey? Praise the Lord. 
God bless you. Thank you so much, Bishop. I do thank the Lord for this privilege and opportunity to greet you on today. I would like to wish you all a happy Independence Day, a happy 4th of July. And I want to encourage you that as you celebrate your independence and your civil liberties, that you also uh, be mindful to stand firm in the liberty wherewith Christ have made you free. We are needed as saints of God as never before to be resolute about who we are, about what we believe, and to stand firm um, at the picnics, at the family reunions, and as we're sitting at the table dining. We want to be always be mindful of who we are as Christians. May you have a safe, and prosperous Independence Day. May you enjoy family and friends uh, as you live in this day. I agree with the song. I am glad to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and we are blessed to live here. And certainly a part of my daily prayers is that God will bless America. God bless you and make it a great day. Take care. Thank you, honey, for those words of wisdom and greetings as we celebrate the 4th of July, Independence Day. What a nation this is. And concerning being free, concerning being blessed, as I thought about this service tonight, my friends, the Lord gave me a word to share with you tonight that is going to bless you, I believe, real good. And that word is found in John's Gospel, chapter number 10 and verse 10, where the Lord said this, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy, and to destroy, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight about freedom in Christ as we celebrate the 4th of July, Independence Day of this great nation that we live in. And you know, there are so many who are quick to point out that America is not perfect. No nation is. America has problems. All nations do. But let me tell you, by far, We'll win. We're living in the greatest nation on the face of this, this earth. And I often tell people that uh, you won life's lottery simply to be born here. And not only do I think we need to recognize the greatness of our nation, I think we need to make sure we do what is necessary to protect it, that we protect our borders, that we uh, protect our laws, that we protect our time-honored institutions, that we do what is necessary to keep our nations strong and to serve mainly the God of the Bible. I believe that the Judeo-Christian concept, or that is Old Testament and New Testament is what made America possible and made America great. Now, our text tonight comes from an interesting, it's on the heels of a very interesting event that, that many times uh, people fail to tie the two together. And what happened is this. Our Lord, according to John's Gospel chapter number 9, and starting at the first verse and down, he healed a blind man who was born from birth. His condition was congenial. And the question was asked, who did sin that this man was born blind? His mom, his dad, or himself? The traditional belief was that if someone was born afflicted, then uh, that had to be the result of either the sin of the parents or somehow in the embryonic stage that individual themselves committed a sin. And Jesus gave a powerful answer that I want you, uh, I want you to look at tonight. He said, neither have sinned this man nor his parents but that the works of God might be manifest in him. Now this shows right here that even before we are born, 
And this is the reason why abortion is such an awful thing. That before we are born, God has designs on our lives. He was not alive and yet God determined that I am going to use this man that the works of God, that my works might be manifested in him. And the Lord allowed a condition, blindness, to be a part of his life from day one so that you, so that I would benefit and the Christians down through the years, people down through the years, all the number of sermons that have been preached, the number of lessons that have been learned based on this man who was born blind. God determined. Praise the Lord that I would allow blindness to be a part of this individual so that the works of God might be manifested in him. And I believe that you can hardly, we can't even count the souls. We can't count the souls that have been blessed as a result of the Lord deciding while this man was in his embryonic state, God decided to allow blindness to afflict him. And then Jesus said this. He says, I must work the works of him that have sent me while it is day. For night cometh when no man can work. Jesus said, my time is running out. And I'm going to work the works of him that sent me. And one of the works that the father sent Jesus to do was to heal this man. Isn't that amazing? Heal this man during our Lord's earthly ministry because he knew that this would uh, cause a chain of events to take place that would cause souls to be saved and would help us learn biblical truths. And, he's, and Jesus said this, he said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And here's what the Lord did to, to this man. He sent him to a pool and told him to uh, wash his eyes, told him to wash. And the man went his way and he washed and came sighted. He came back seeing. God worked a miracle of astounding proportions on this man and this caused <laughs> all kinds of joy and all kinds of confusion. The Bible says in verse 8 of John's Gospel chapter 9, the neighbors therefore and they which before had seen him that was blind said is not this he that sat and begged because he was blind he didn't have a job he couldn't earn a living there were no training special trainings for the blind and the handicapped and those who are physically challenged today just uh, in his day his only option was to he was a, he was itinerant he depended on the kindness of others. And they called him a beggar. And some said, this is he. Others said, well, it's someone who looks like him. But he spoke up. <laughs> God knew the man's personality. And uh, the man spoke up and said, I am. Uh, the King James Version says, I am. And they added he. Uh, uh, there you see the he is a telecide. He said, it's me. Yes, I was blind. I was blind, but now I see a miracle have been performed. Verse 10 says, therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes open? How did this happen? <laughs> and he answered and said, listen to this, my friends tonight. Listen to this. He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus, look at this, made clay. Jesus made clay. You know, I, I, I skipped that part as I was leading up to it. Verse 6 says, when Jesus had spoken, that he spat on the ground. He didn't spit on the man. He didn't spit in the man's face. 
he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes. He anointed the eyes of the blind uh, blind man. He put he smeared clay over his eyes and then said to him, "Go and uh, and and wash, wash." Wash, you know, in antiquity, a spittle was uh, thought to have some medicinal properties. So Jesus, my friends, were, he was not trying to belittle the man nor insult the man. Uh, in as I said, in antiquity, spittle was believed to have divine. Uh, medical, excuse me, properties. So Jesus here was acting as a physician. And he made the clay, anointed the man's eyes, sent him to, to go wash. He went and washed, and he came back seeing. And all the man knew was that the person who did it was a man named Jesus. <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. He said, he sent me, he sent me to the pool of Siloam. I went, and I washed, and I received sight. And they said unto him, where is he? <laughs> and he said, I don't know where he is. I know not where uh, he is. Uh, they, and, uh, and guess what they did? You know, there's always someone who can't help you, but they got something negative to say about your being helped. The Bible says, and they brought, uh, look at this, and they brought to the Pharisees him that was born blind. They brought him to the Pharisees, and this ensued another chain of events. The man stood his ground. As a matter of fact, he would not deny how he got healed. They tried to talk him out of it. They tried to get him to take it back, And uh, and but the, see, the problem that they had was the one thing you can't deny is that everybody knew that this man was blind, and this man could see, and the man said, a man named Jesus uh, made spittle out of clay, took, took clay out of spittle, and he anointed me, and I came back seeing. As a matter of fact, they went to his parents, and uh, his parents, because the Pharisees did not want to believe that Jesus did it. And this is why, friends, you ought to testify, tell of the goodness of the Lord. There are enemies of Jesus Christ out there. There are people out there who think that the church is filled with hypocrites, that, uh, that Christians aren't real, that the Lord is not real, that God's not a miracle worker. Well, it's our job to make sure they hear the stories. Let us not allow the world and the enemies of, of biblical Christianity Let's not allow them to define us. Let's tell our own story. Let's tell the people what the Lord has done for us. You know, we took testimony service out of the church. I think we may need to go back to testifying and telling of his goodness because the Lord is good. The Lord is, is still in the miracle working business. He still saves. He changes people. He sets free. Prostitutes are coming to Jesus. Pimps are coming to Jesus. Homosexuals, lesbians are, are coming to Jesus. Adulterers, liars, killers, thieves are coming to Jesus and Jesus is saving people and changing people and people are living new lives as a result of knowing Jesus Christ. Cancers are yet being dried up. High blood pressure is being brought down. Low blood is being brought up. Diabetes are being healed. All kinds of things are happening in the church and around the world. People are being delivered. The dead are being raised. Blind eyes are, are being opened. People are being set free. And yet many times we allow the world to define us by just a few ne'er-do-wells, just a few people who go astray and people point at those people and say, well, that's the church. Well, my friends, that's not the church. It may be that church, but it ain't the church. And it's certainly not the work of Christ. Christ is moving by his spirit. He's moving in all the world. And as the song says, signs and wonders, God is using, move, oh God, in me. And when he moves in you, my friends, make sure you tell it. Make sure you share. You know, make sure you tell people how in your darkest moment, praise the Lord, why you was going through. 
Maybe you lost a loved one. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe depression tried to grab hold to you. Maybe you at your lowest point. Why not share how the Lord stepped in and turned things around when it seemed as though the weight of the world was on your shoulders? You know Jesus stepped in and made a way. Tell it. Tell it, tell it. They went to the man's parents. Let me get back on point, Brother Gary. They went to the man's parents and, and said to them, uh, is this your son, verse, verse 19, and they asked them, saying, is this uh, young man who, <laughs> look at this, is, is he your son whom ye say was born blind? And then how doth he now see? And his parents answered and said, we know that this is our son. <laughs> they couldn't deny him. And yes, he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, he's grown, go ask him. Then verse 22 tells us something chilling. And we see this so much today. We see this so much today. Verse 22 says, These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, that he would be put out of the synagogue, that he would be excommunicated. And, and to be excommunicated from the synagogue meant no one would speak to you. No one in the city would do business with you. If you owned a business, they would stop patronizing you. No one would have anything to do with you. And you would have a miserable life. You'd be ostracized greatly. And it's sad today that people are putting their own self-interest ahead of the interest of the kingdom. Think of the number of people who are afraid to speak up. Think of the number of preachers who are afraid to preach the truth for fear that uh, a certain family may leave that church. You're afraid to come out. You know that you shouldn't be a part of some of these wicked organizations and uh, sororities and fraternities and different things that you find, find yourself in. You know that these things aren't biblical, but you won't take a stand because you're afraid that you will be excommunicated. You're afraid that, you, that people won't vote for you. You're afraid that people will, will stand against you or that, that they will drop you from the call list. They would drop you from the text thread. Let me tell you something, my friends. I'd rather have Jesus than the fellowship with all of the world. For there can't nobody do you like Jesus. And if you have Christ on your side, you have the truth on your side. And Jesus Christ uh, is more than all the people in the world being on your side. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, if God be for us. That is, since God is for us, then who can be against us? I'd rather have Jesus than all the world. My friends, I'll tell you something. I'd rather have Jesus than to have you. Glory be to God. But these parents, these parents, they called themselves trying to cover themselves. They, they, they didn't deny that he was their son. They didn't deny that he was born blind, born blind, but they lied about this miracle. You would think that they would be so excited that their son can now see that, it, that life has changed for him, that he can do something now other than beg, that he would not be a burden to them any longer. He can get a job. He can work. Life would be exciting for him. But no, they instead they they cowered down. The Bible says in verse 23, therefore his parents, therefore said his parents, he's of age, ask him. They went back to him and they asked him again. And he said, Look, I've told you. <laughs> you keep asking me. I've already told you uh, that uh, that Jesus healed me. And uh and, and you know what they said in verse 24. I got, I got to deal with this and I'm, 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 almost, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I know you're celebrating the fourth, but let me show you this. The Bible says in verse 24, Then again called the man, then again called they the man that was blind, and said unto him, look at this, Give praise to God. Give God praise. <laughs> Give praise to Yahweh. 
you know, they're, 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 they're going to that Judaistic roots. Give praise to the God of the Old Testament. Give praise to him. We know that this man is a sinner. Now, they were right when they said give praise to God. They were right when they said give praise to Yahweh. They were right when they said give praise to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But oh, they were wrong when they called Jesus Christ, the Christ of God, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one uh, who was to come. They were wrong to call Jesus a sinner. Jesus is the one man who walked this earth in human form, in flesh, and in, the, in sinful flesh, and yet he never sinned. The Bible teaches that Christ was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. That is, Jesus was tempted to the nth degree, and yet he never sinned. One writer said that Satan walked off from Jesus, walked away from him frustrated and mad and chomping at the bit, and, and Satan was saying to himself, he just simply will not sin. And Lucifer, you are right. Christ never sinned. And how dare they call Jesus a sinner. Give praise to God, they said. Let's praise Yahweh. But this man is a sinner. And I love, I love the, uh, the man who was born blind. I love this formerly born, formerly blind man's answer. Because he was sincere. He said, verse 25, he answered and said, whether he be, I'm, I'm reading from the King James, I just love it. I love the old English, Elizabethan language. He says, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing, one thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Go on and preach with your bad self, mister. Then said they unto him, again, what did he uh, to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And he answered and said, I told you already. And you wouldn't hear me. Wherefore, uh, why you, do you want to hear it again? Will you become his disciple? <laughs> A little sarcasm. Uh, from from this man. Just, why do you want to hear it again? Are you ready to follow him? Oh my. And then they reviled him. These, they insulted him. These Pharisees, boy, they were blind. They insulted him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. Not even realize that Moses prophesied of him. Moses said, The Lord thy God shall bring forth a prophet like unto me. Him shall ye hear. <laughs> and then they said in verse 29, and we know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this, listen to this, but as for this fellow, we know not, we know not from whence he is. Well, you don't know where he's from, but Moses could tell you where he was from because Moses, because this fellow, this man spake to Moses. Hallelujah. And uh, uh, then look at this, verse 30 says, Then the man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing? He, he said, now this is something. This is something that you, you know not whence he is. You don't know why he's coming from, but yet he did something that you couldn't do. He opened my eyes. He worked a miracle that none of you Pharisees put together could perform. I've been blind all my life, and you've seen me begging. You didn't heal me. And yet the man who has healed me, and you guys are supposed to be the authority. You are the experts of the law. You have the scribes. You, you, you are the Pharisees. You are the righteous ones. I, you, you, you're washing your hands all the time. You, you love to gather at widows' houses. You, you wear your phylacteries. You got all of the garb. You got the talk, but you have no power. And you walk past me all my life, 
and I was blind and you left me that way and yet this man comes. I meet him for the first time and all I know about him is that his name is Jesus. I don't know where he lives. I don't know anything else about him but I know this. He opened my eyes and I see. Now you're trying to get me to deny him. You got to be crazy. I like this guy. I like him. I, Gary, I think he's the man. So this man said to them, um, uh, he said, now, you, you, you don't know him, but he opened my eyes and he said this. This is powerful. Verse 31, he says, now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. You calling him a sinner. But we know that God heareth not sinners. And God healed me through this man. So he's got to be special. And then he really got on, he got on verse 32 and down. He said, now since the world began, it, it, it uh, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. And if this man were not of God, he could do nothing. If he was truly not of God, he could not have healed me. Which is, this is a fancy way of him saying to them, you're not of God. <laughs> because you didn't heal me. You couldn't help me. You could give me a penny or two, throw a little denarius in the, in the cup, but this man healed me. And look at this. And here's what I really wanted to get to. And it takes me all day to get somewhere. But the Bible is like that. The Bible says, verse 34, They answered and said unto him, Thou was altogether born in sin. Now they're calling the man illegitimate. <laughs> that you're a bastard. Now you just went and finished talking to the man's parents. Now you're calling the man illegitimate. And doth thou teach us? You're going to teach us. You're going to tell us. You're going to tell. You're going to teach us what the, what the word of God says. What the Torah says. You're going to teach us the writings of the Mishnah. You're going to teach us. The Bible says, and they cast them out. Which is exactly where, where they, when they put him out of the synagogue. Now listen to me. Listen to me tonight. When they put him out of the synagogue, I'm going to show you that that's exactly where Jesus wanted him. I want to encourage you. Listen, listen, to, listen to me tonight. Listen to me. If you can listen to me and eat that hot dog, do both. But if you can't, stop chewing for a minute and listen to me. Let Jesus manage your life. Let Jesus use you. Let Jesus take full control. Because let me tell you, when Jesus is the driver, when Jesus is in control, then guess what? He's never out of control. And even when it looks like you're going down, you're going up. Even when it appears that you're being cursed, you're being blessed. Even when it appears that you're falling behind, your way ahead. This move, them putting him out of the synagogue, they excommunicated him from Judaism. Brother Rocket, they put him out. They put him out. They put him out. They put him out of the church. They excommunicated him from Judaism. Are you following me tonight? And when they put him out, and Jesus heard, look at this, that they had cast him out. Now this man is, he's a man without a religion. He's a man without a place to worship. He's a man, he has his sight, but he has no religion. They excommunicated him. And when Jesus heard him, look at what happened. When he heard that they cast him out. And when he had found him, Jesus went looking for him. My friends, he found me one day. <laughs> and he found you. Look at this. 
He found him and said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And I love this guy. This guy was so, he's so honest. And he answered and said, Who is the Lord that I might believe? Just show him to me. Introduce me to him. I believe. Who is he? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Wow. Now the man is free. He's free to accept Jesus. He's free to have life and to have it more abundantly. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. He believed. He dropped every, everything that could have hindered his belief. Everything they taught him in the synagogue that could have tripped him up. Everything that he believed. And they had already taken it from him. All, all of his sincerely held beliefs were snatched away because Jesus healed him. And that man said to Jesus, Lord, I believe. And Jesus said, verse 39, for, the judge, for judgment am I come into the world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see may, not, may be made blind. He said, I've come to make sure the righteous blind see. And I've come to make sure blinding takes place for the unrighteous who should have known better. Now, I'm going to tell you church some, folks something. You who have been around religion all your life. You've been raised in the church and you know better. Look if you reject God's truth one time too many. Let me tell you what will happen. He turns you over to whatever you reject this truth for. This is why many drug addicts and people who are currently in a, in a crack house and people who are going through will come to know Jesus and understand Jesus much better than you. And you've been in the church all your life because you're filled with doubt. Let me tell you something. To whom much is given, much is required. And if you've been raised in the church, you better hear me tonight. You better hear me tonight. You've been raised in the church and taught the ways of the Lord. And you're out there in the world and you're just rejecting it because you can. And you like being the preacher's kid or the saint's child or the deacon's son or the supervisor's daughter, the bishop's children who love to walk in disobedience. You're setting yourself up to be blinded by God. And you'll see people who, who was, wasn't even raised in the church and they're able to come in and shout and get saved and embrace Jesus and love Jesus. And you end up lost. Look at this. So Jesus says in chapter number 10. Verse 1 he says. Verily, verily I say unto you. That he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. But climbeth up some other way. The same as a thief and a robber. When Jesus mentioned the sheep, the sheepfold. The sheepfold. He is actually, the sheepfold uh, is a type here. It represents the nation of Israel. It represents the religion of Judaism. The only true religion that was on the earth at the time because Jesus had come to fulfill the law and to, not to, obliterate it but he was who the law was pointing to and he came according to the Hebrew writer to bring us a better way in fact the Hebrew writer says the things that was taught in the law they were a shadow of the good things to come the good thing to come was the Lord Jesus himself dying on the cross to establish this great religion, this great move of God called Christianity. Oh my, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad to be a representative of Christ here. Listen, I'm running out of time, but I, let, me, let me try to move. But you know, you know, Brother Wooden will go off into the weeds in a heartbeat because the Bible is so powerful. He said now, verily, verily, that is truly, truly, I say unto you, that he that entereth in by the door, 
He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other ways a thief and a robber. Now, the sheepfold was a mud brick shelter that was partially covered that only had one way in and uh, one door in and it had a fence around it and the sheep would be taken into the fold at night after they had grazed all day. And as I mentioned, there was only one entrance in to the sheep fold. So now the, the, the text says. Verily verily I say unto you. That he that entereth not by the door. There's only one door into the sheep fold. But come climbeth up some other way. The same as a thief and a robber. There were always thieves. And robbers. Who were trying to get in to the sheep fold. Bandits and gorillas who were trying to get in to the sheepfold so that they could plunder and hurt the sheep who were in the fold. The fold representing Judaism and the nation of Israel. And you know, my friends, who was in the fold? You know who was in the fold? Do you know who was in the fold? The blind man was in the fold. And look at what happened to him. Look at how they handled him who was in the fold. Those Pharisees were thieves and robbers. They didn't treat that man right. The man gave the right answer. He told the truth. They, these people who were in the fold but they weren't real and all of us know people who are in the church, but they don't mind damaging people. They don't mind hurting the sincere. They don't mind walking on the little guy or the little gal. They don't mind with their lofty titles mistreating people simply because they can. And many times their argument is, it is the bishops or the superintendents or the supervisors or the pastor's prerogative. Well, let me tell you something. Just because you can do a thing, that doesn't mean that you should do it. And you got to be careful how you treat God's people, especially the least of these. Jesus indicted those Pharisees right then and there. Said, now, these men were thieves and robbers. But he says this. Look at this. But he that entereth in by the door, he that cometh in by the door, door who enters in legally is the shepherd of the sheep. The true shepherd doesn't find a illegal way to enter into the sheepfold. The shepherd has the right to enter in and he enters in properly. Are you listening to me today? The, he enters in properly properly into the sheep fold and then the bible says this now i want you to follow me here it says to him the porter openeth now right here he switches metaphors and he goes from the metaphor of the door to he's speaking to the part the potter the person who opens the door to let the sheep come in now the interesting thing here is there is much disagreement or discussion on who the porter was. Some say the porter was the Old Testament, which when Jesus came along, opened the door to him as he walked into the sheepfold, which was Judaism, to win souls to Christ. Some say that the porter was John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And then others say that the porter was the Holy Spirit who when Jesus come would prick the heart of the person who's heard the gospel and they would give their lives to Jesus. And, and notice what it says. And when the porter, the porter came, the porter would open the door to him. He would enter into the sheep. The sheep would know his voice. And look at this, my friends. He'd call his own sheep by name. And by the way, shepherds named every one of their sheep 
each sheep from every fold knew the name of their shepherd. Now notice this. He would call them by their name. Remember now the sheepfold is Judaism. It is Israel. It, and notice what he would do. He would call them by name. And look where he would lead them. And he would lead them out. He would bring them out. So when they put this man out of the synagogue, when they put him out of Judaism, when they excommunicated him, they meant it for evil, but they did God a favor. And they did the man a favor. Because when Jesus comes and saves you, Jesus brings you out. Come ye out from among them and be ye separated. Separate, saith the Lord. Do you hear me, Masons? Do you hear me, sororities, fraternities? Do you hear me, believers who are in secret organizations? You got secret handshakes. You're taking secret vows. You read secret books. You have a secret name. When you come to Jesus, when you come to Jesus, he brings you out. Somebody said, would you better not talk about that? They may not vote for it. Then don't. But when you come, when you come to Jesus, Jesus brings you out. Jesus brings us out of sin. He brings us out of the club. Jesus brings you out of promiscuity. Jesus brings you out of wickedness. He brings you out of the LBGTQ and all of those alphabets. Jesus brings you out. The, when you're born again, you take off the old man and put on the new. Jesus said, I've reached in and to the, 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 the Old Testament, John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit. Whomever pricked your heart, when you came to meet me, I came to grab you by the hand and say, come on out of that bar. Come on out of prostitution. Come on out of drug addiction. Come out of lying. Come out of a life of misery and sin. Come out, come out, come out. Follow me. I have a life for you. Isn't that wonderful? And you who are watching tonight, oh, I can feel it. You're being touched. I know you're being touched because he brought you out. <laughs> What did, what did uh, uh, Bishop Mason say when he got filled with the Holy Ghost? What did he say? He brought me out of the miry clay. What a mighty God we serve. He brought me, he brought me out. He's brought you out. Aren't you glad to be out? Aren't you glad to be free? That'll preach right there. He's brought me, he brought me out. And he leadeth them out. He leadeth them. He doesn't, he doesn't pull you out. He don't twist your arm. He doesn't beat you up. He, he gently leads you out. Some of you who are watching, you've been resisting, you've been resisting, you've been fighting, but you know I'm right. And the Lord is telling you, he's whispering to you, he's disturbing your sleep. He's saying, come out. At first you argue with me, then you found out that it wasn't my voice, but it's the Lord's voice. The Lord is calling you out. Amen. When, when they put that man out of the synagogue, they meant it for evil. In the words of Joseph, Said so you, you when you sold me, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I told you, let the Lord manage your life. When when the Lord is the manager of your life, sometimes when it appears that you're down, you're actually up. When it appears that you're out, you're actually in. When it appears that you're falling behind, you're actually way ahead. Just just follow Him. Just follow Him. <laughs> let it play out. Let the Lord have His way. So He leadeth them out, and when and when He put it. Put forth his own sheep. He goes before them. Praise the Lord. And the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. You know what a mighty God we serve. He takes care of us. And, and you know. One of the wonderful things about the Lord. Is that. Uh, uh, with, the, with the natural shepherd. And, and I'm wrapping this up with the natural. Natural. Well, let me just move on because I, I, I can get caught in the weeds here and I'm running out of time. But look, watch this. He says, <clears throat> uh, and a stranger they will not follow because they don't, they, they don't know his voice. Uh, some of you need to get the Holy Spirit because you're following strangers. And that's a sign that you hadn't been filled yet. Because when you know Jesus, you're not easily misled. And uh, verse 7 says, then, Jesus, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, this is interesting. 
This is wonderful. This is wonderful. It's going to bless you, what I'm getting ready to tell you uh, here. You know, after a, a day of grazing in the field, the sheep been out there grazing all day. The shepherd would lead them back to the sheepfold. And each sheep that entered in, the shepherd would count them and the shepherd would in inspect them. And if he saw that the, one of the sheep was scarred or wounded, David said, he anointed my head with oil. He would anoint that sheep with oil so as to cause, to accelerate the healing process. And if one of the sheep came back and he could tell that the sheep was thirsty, he would give that sheep water. Whatever the sheep's needs were, the shepherd would provide it as he brings the sheep into the sheepfold, into the sheep pen to spend the night so that they would, could rest peacefully in the night. Would lock them in the pen. Now remember, he would keep count. So he would make sure that no one is missing. Every sheep is, is in there and they're all safe. And, and watch what he would do. Then the shepherd would lay, lay in the door himself. He would lay across the door of the sheepfold, assuring that he would be their protector. I'm telling you, my friends, Jesus Christ has been laying at the foot of the door for me all of my life. He has protected me. He has watched over me. And you have to admit that he's been there for you all the time. And every time, what a mighty God we serve. He shifts metaphors and says, now nah, I'm the door of the sheep. I'm protecting you. Try, if you will, you thief, you robber. Try, you animal, you wolf, whatever. I'm here to protect my sheep. And then Jesus said this. I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. You know, I'm, I'm a preacher. I'm, 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 this is my fifth closing. Closing. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. They are tricksters and plunderers. That is, everyone who came before me, because Israel had a problem. Israel, people in Judaism had a problem. There were always people showing up claiming to be the Messiah. Because they knew that the Jews were expecting a Messiah. So Jesus said, all who came before me, claiming to be the one, they were lying to you. They are thieves and they are robbers. They are, they are bandits and they are plunderers. Oh my, they're thieves and robbers. But the sheep, the true sheep, did not hear them. One of the things that biblic, biblical Christianity does, it, it, it protects you from being gullible. Gullibility is not a characteristic of the truly saved and the truly born again. We're not gullible when it comes to politics. We're not gullible when it comes to life choices. We're not gullible when it comes to all these things that Satan is doing to try to fool us. We're not gullible because the Holy Spirit is in us. And the Bible teaches that it warns against uh, silly women who are laden with sin and, and burdened down with all kinds of lust. How that the, the, the wicked, the, the false teachers would target them. Woman of God, man of God, don't be a gullible Christian. Believe the Bible. Believe the word of God and stand on God's word. And he said this, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go out every morning and come in every night 
and fine pasture. I'll feed him every day. And I'll keep him safe every night if you come in through me. And as I close, he says, the thief cometh not. These false false teachers, these false teachers, these false messiahs, these arrogant Pharisees, like the ones who mishandled the man who was born blind, the ones who put him out of the church. They meant him evil, but God meant, meant it for good. Yes, these people, the thief, all they want to do is take advantage of you. And I know that many times when we read this, we just, we point directly at the devil. And it is the devil, but you need to understand that he wasn't talking about, he wasn't talking specifically about Lucifer when he was saying this. He was talking about people who had Lucifer in them, and by extension, that is Lucifer. But they have ways to trick you. They show up looking mighty religious. They show up telling you they got all kinds of connections for you. They show up te- showing you all the advantages that you can have if you just go along with them. They show up promising you that they won't excommunicate you. Oh, they make all kinds of promises. But the truth is, all they do is steal from you. Steal kill and destroy but Jesus said I am come and I feel like preaching that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly and I thank God tonight that I can stand before you On the 4th of July, the year of our Lord, 2024, and you're watching me, and we can say to each other that we have life, and because of Christ, we have it more abundantly. What a mighty God we serve. Happy July 4th. Happy Independence Day to every one of you. Listen. If the Lord touches your heart tonight, it's on the screen. Send us an offering. If this message has blessed you, then support us. Help us continue to do what it is that God has given us to do. The information is on the screen there. And while you get the information and you get your QR code, hurry, hurry, hurry. Because I want to pray before I dismiss. I want to pray that you come out of everything that God would have you to come out of. And that you discover what millions, if not billions of Christians have discovered down through the years. And it's simply this. That Jesus is all that we need. That Jesus is more than enough. And that Jesus is coming again. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this nation. We thank you for this 4th of July celebration. We thank you for this opportunity to speak to the people of God in the name of Jesus. You are a true God. You're the holy God and an everlasting king. And we thank you for life and we thank you for having it more abundantly. We are grateful for, oh my, what Judaism brought us. And we're grateful for the law. And we're grateful for Moses. We're grateful for the prophets. We're grateful for the, oh, the sacrifices and all the things that were done. But they were only pointing to the more abundant life of grace and peace that comes with Jesus Christ. An eternity that is promised to us. And we thank you for having life and having it more abundantly. We thank you for being truly free on this Independence Day. Now, Lord, bless the remainder of the evening. Cause your face to ever shine upon us. And bless us to meet again at the appointed hour. Here at the upper room, it will be this coming Sunday. And there is a word from the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching tonight, my friends. I love you with the love of the Lord. And let everybody say, God first. God bless you.